First Kings chapter 8 brings us the theme of our conference. If you looked at your book, or you're bored now and you want to look at your book, you'll note that there is a statement that is made in chapter 8 and verse 43 that gives us our context of our theme. And the, the speaker here at this point is Solomon. And he's in the middle of a prayer. And we're reading the words of his prayer. Amen. When we understand the context of his prayer, it'll help us more. But I want you to see where we're going. And then I'm going to rewind and take us all the way back to the beginning. Not Genesis, but close. Take us back to the beginning and show you how we got there to this prayer. And then in the last hour and a half of the message, hopefully convey one thought. Look at 1 Kings 8.43. Some of you thought I was kidding. <laughs> Hear thou in heaven, I'm eight, chapter 8, verse 43. Hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and do according to all that the stranger calleth to thee for, that all the people of the earth may know thy name to fear thee, Amen. as do thy people Israel, and that they may know that this house which I have builded, is called by thy name. Let's pray. Father, I feel the weight of this moment as we get started. Our hearts were taken to Lebanon and Philadelphia to see what you are doing there. I thank you for the town family and how they've served you. And Father, how they've set a great example. Thank you for encouraging their hearts a few moments ago with the willingness of the, the capital folks to be able to go up to Philly and be able to distribute literature. Father, I pray you'll bless that endeavor and future endeavors as we know this church believes in starting churches. Tonight, dear Father, as we start this conference, I pray that you will settle my thoughts on the singular line that you have for me to share, that you'll fill me with your spirit, and that you'll help your people to listen under the power of the Holy Spirit as well. Speak to hearts, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This conference is about the theme that has been chosen. We are looking for missionaries who will make the name of Christ known to wherever God has called them. That is the objective. You say, well, what does it mean to make his name known? We will get to that maybe by Sunday night because I got 66 verses to read here. Just kidding. <laughs> but I want you to realize this. When a missionary goes, he is doing, or she, he, they are doing just that. They are making known the name of Christ. Go with me to verse 1. And let me give you the context of this, because as we talk about this statement, making him, his name know, or that all the people of the earth may know his name, Realize that we have with us missionaries this week who are going to Philadelphia, Cambodia, Haiti, Ghana, and uh, did I see the Kellys are coming too? In, oh, in November. Okay, I was thinking, I saw their name on the thing, and I thought, they're coming too? I was just with them on Sunday, and they went somewhere else. I think, I don't think they're coming here. So I sent a picture to them and said, are you supposed to be here? But, um, but you have, as you have these all that have, are listed here that are coming, I realize this is that we're asking and considering, will they go and make Christ's name known? But Solomon got to that place in his prayer because of this moment. Verse 1. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and the, all the heads of the tribes, the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel, unto King Solomon in Jerusalem, that they might bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. That was the goal. The Ark of the Covenant of God was everything to the children of Israel. It was the symbolic, uh, the, the emblem of his presence. In the Ark at this point are, contains the two tables of stone that God had given to Moses the second time after he broke his first tablet. He had apple care and he got more. And, uh, and so in that, in that sense, the Ark of the Covenant represented everything. And now they're going to get the Ark of the Covenant of God. Two, verse two. All the men of Israel assembled themselves unto King Solomon to the feast in the month of Ethanim, which is the seventh month. 
And all the elders of Israel came. And the priests took up the ark, and they brought the ark of the covenant, the ark of the Lord, and the tabernacle of the congregation, and all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle. Even those did the priests and Levites bring up. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be told nor numbered for the multitude. This is symbolic. This is literal. It was a literal event that took place, but this is symbolic of their love and worship for God. These people loved God. This was a good season in Israel's history because they wanted to have this temple. They wanted to have what God wanted to have and where he decided to put his name. Verse 6. The priest brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto his place in the oracle of the house to the most holy place even under the wings of the cherubims. For the cherubims spread forth their two wings over the place of the ark and the cherubims covered the ark and the staves thereof. And they drew out the staves. The end of the staves were seen out in the holy place before the oracle and they were not seen without and there they are unto this day. Amen. There was nothing in the ark save the two tables of stone which Moses put there at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Amen. This is an amazing moment in Israel's history. Everything had been about their worship as a tabernacle, a tent, if you will. And this was the tent that traveled with them through the wilderness, and now Solomon is able to build the building. His father was refused that privilege to build the building for God because he was a man of blood. And so David, with permission from God, gathered all of the resources necessary for his son to come along and build this temple. And now Solomon has this moment, a moment that all Israel will remember. They've moved this Ark of the Covenant. It's come with great, if you allow me to say it, holy fanfare with the idea of saying that they're sacrificing all of these animals as they go. The priests are carrying the Ark of the Covenant with these long rods, these staves, if you will. They're holding it. They put it in its place. They pull the staves out. And God's glory filled the temple. You say, Brother O'Malley, what is that like? I don't know. There have been times I've been in a few church services where I felt like this is truly a moving of God. Amen. You say, well, I've seen modern churches. They have smoke in their services. <laughs> this was without the machine. <laughs> says that the priests in verse 11 couldn't minister because of the cloud. Why? The glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. We are uh, becoming more and more a casual society. That cultural influence is affecting our churches as well. And we too, as churches, are being influenced more and more to be more casual. There is nothing casual about this moment. This is as auspicious as it gets. This is as amazing as it becomes. The glory of God has filled the temple. It is at this moment that I begin to get a sense of Solomon's wonder and awe. You know we, are going to, we're, we read one verse, one statement out of his prayer that he made. But I'm telling you all the stuff that leads up to it, so when we get back to that statement by Saturday or Sunday, we'll have a better sense of it. Verse, verse 12. Then, Solomon, then spake Solomon to me, if I project myself onto Solomon and say, how would I feel at this moment? And because he is not saying to whom he is speaking, I wonder if he is just stating this for himself. Notice the words. The Lord said that he would dwell in thick darkness because in a moment he's going to say to the congregation, he's going to turn to the congregation, and in another moment he's going to turn to God. But in this moment he's just speaking. I wonder if a sense of awe has hit him of what this moment would have meant to, meant to his father. 
a sense of awe and wonder in this, uh, in understanding what this meant to God, what this meant to Israel, what this meant in their community, if you will, what it meant for the city of Jerusalem, and what it meant that in this place, where this temple was built and Solomon built it, that God would put his presence there, and even what it would mean to the strangers in the land. You say, who are the strangers? Not born Israelites. You say, well, why would people not born Israelites want to come and be Israelites? Well, this has always been on the heart of God from Genesis 12 forward, that God would always take care of the nations of the earth through Israel, would be blessed. In the second giving of the law in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter number 12, in verse 5 and verse 11, both it refers to the fact that there will come a day that I will put my house and I'll put my name on that house. I'll call that house mine. And strangers will come from another land to the one true God. Before there was a temple... God said this place would happen. So now Solomon stands there and he says in verse number 12, the Lord said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. This is, goes back to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 21 where it refers to the fact that, that God spoke from the darkness. And throughout Scripture you'll see that mentioning that he is hiding himself. He's not disclosing himself. Man is not seeing him. The closest was when he, he allowed Moses to pass behind him as his back was to him and Moses passed by. These, this is it. That's, but God has ministered to his people from the darkness. And in this moment, Solomon is saying, well, the Lord said he would dwell in thick darkness. And then he speaks to God. I have surely built thee in house to dwell in. A settled place for thee to abide forever. A settled place. Amen. What's the opposite? An unsettled place. What would that reference? The tabernacle. They had the tent. They moved the tent. They set the tent up. They put the tent down. They moved the tent again. They set it up wherever they were. Now they're going to have one place. A place for Israel. A place for strangers. A place for any who would be drawn there by God. Note further, if you would please. And the king turned his face about and blessed all the congregation of Israel. Watch these words. And all the congregation of Israel stood. Amen. He testifies to them and says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which spake with his mouth unto David my father, and hath with his hand fulfilled it, saying, Since the day that I brought forth my people Israel out of Egypt, I chose no city out of all the tribes of Israel to build a house that my name might be therein. Please note the significance of that statement that his name would be there. It's not just to say, oh, we built this. God is saying, I am calling that physical abode mine. Amen. I'm putting my name on it. This is not like we, we would have a monument to somebody. This is the place where the God of heaven has said, I want to be right there. Verse number 17. It was in the heart of David, my father, to build a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. So 16, my name might be therein. 17, my dad wanted to build this house so God's name could be there for Israel's sake. 18, the Lord said unto David, my father, whereas it was in thine heart to build a house unto my name, that thou didst dwell that was in thine heart. Nevertheless, thou shalt not build the house, but thy son that shall come forth out of thy loins, he shall build the house unto my name. Who was Solomon's mom? Bathsheba. You say, what? The, main, the same woman, Bathsheba, and the roof, and the, uh, the murder of Uriah, the Hittite, and all that? Yes, and even in all of that mess, God found beauty. Amen. Chose Solomon. In verse 20, he says, And the Lord hath performed his word that he spake. And I am risen up in the room of David my father and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised and have built a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. Keep in mind the significance of God giving his name to a place. 
Keep this in mind as we move through this text rather quickly, but just to see that where God puts his name, those that he claims as his, that which he appropriates for himself, this name is the designation for his people. This is the place where he wanted his people to worship. Now Solomon stands before, 22, and Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation and spread forth his hands toward the heaven. I want you to jump ahead. Just keep right there for a second and just turn quickly over to, I believe it's 54. Look at 54. And it was so that when Solomon made an end of praying all this prayer and supplication unto the Lord, he arose from before the altar of the Lord from kneeling on his knees with his hands spread up to heaven, and he stood and blessed the congregation of Israel with a loud voice. From verse 22, Solomon is standing before the altar of the Lord, and he spreads forth his hands toward heaven. It isn't until 54 that we get the idea that somewhere in his prayer, either at the beginning or in the midst of it, he is on his knees, and his hands are extended to heaven. Now, I don't know if it's a this, a this, a this, a this. I have no idea. I just know hands are to heaven, and I know he's on his knees. Pastor Moore, I mentioned a moment ago the casual nature that has hit our culture and is affecting our churches. But I feel that in our churches, it's been generations since we've had a sense of awe and holiness of who God is and a sense of wonder to say that he is worthy. You say, bow, I, I, I don't have to bow to anybody. Well, we, he is God. Amen. He is worthy. It is his name, that name. The name that is wonderful and counselor and the mighty God and the everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. That name. That name is the name that is on that house. Can I give you a little peek to the end of the message? That name is on us. I note here in 22, Solomon begins his prayer. In Solomon's prayer to God, I find incredibly personal. It is instructive. It is insightful. It is inspiring. Amen. It makes me wonder what happened to our prayer life in church today. So what do you mean? The majesty of Solomon's prayer as you read it is overwhelming. It wasn't the same 12 statements strung together that are cliche in our churches that just simply become, God bless the offering, bless the hands that gave it, the hands that laid the food, whatever it is we're praying, all of us know what the person is going to say next as they just utter one statement that, that's familiar after another and nobody really talks to God. You say, well, where's the mission? So that's just a little extra for you. Solomon talked to God. It's missing in our church services. It's missing when we pray for the offering. It's missing when we pray before the service. It's missing. And I, I read that and I say, oh, where, where is this today? Where is that honest, transparent communication that's vulnerable before God to offer such a prayer? Amen. I'm not saying... You should feel bad that you have ever, ever uttered simple statements that have been often repeated in our churches. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just simply saying when you bow your head, you're talking to God. Amen. And Solomon knew that. And I'm not sure. I, I, I can't even speculate. I can just say in 22, he's standing. In 54, he's on his knees because he's crying out to God. 
He asks God and he begins to speak about the reminder of the past of God's covenant with Israel. By the time you get to verse 28, he's asking God to listen to Israel. And then we get to verse 41. And in his prayer, he transitions from praying for Israel to praying for the stranger. Who is a stranger? That's not, you don't have to raise your hand. It's a rhetorical question. The who is a stranger is those who are not part of Israel. And in verse 41, he begins the section of his prayer about Israel. Keeping in mind the whole context here, the ark is in its place. The glory of God's filled the temple. The ministers cannot even conduct their ministry. Solomon has spoken to the Lord. Solomon has spoken to the people. Solomon is speaking to God. He's spoken to God about the, the covenants of Israel. He's spoken to God about asking God to listen to Israel when they pray in this place. And now in verse 41, his attention is drawn to the stranger. Moreover, concerning a stranger that is not of thy people Israel. Remember, this is a prayer. Moreover, concerning a stranger that is not of thy people Israel, but cometh out of a for, far country for thy name's sake. What does that mean? That they were somewhere else, and they heard of God, and they came to his temple to hear of him. Amen. Anybody can think of Queen of Sheba? And when we were at the day of Pentecost, not we in the sense that Brother Moore and I were there, but historically speaking, Brother Wheeler was there. He's old enough to be there, not us. <laughs> at the day of Pentecost, and you see all those nations of all those people who have come, and you realize that Candace the queen, she had come. There has always been an interest in the people of God as those who live for him will testify God has met the need in their life, and now they too are those outside the faith, if you will, now see that and say, what is this thing you have? And he's saying now in his prayer, which harkens all the way back to the promise of, to Abraham, the promise through Moses, and others who have spoken these similar words, he says in 41, concerning the strangers, meaning, God, if there are any people that come to this place who are not of the faith, notice what he's saying to them, or they're coming because of his namesake, maybe they believe in him. I'm not sure how to quantify that. But he says, 42, almost prophetically, for they shall hear of thy great name. Amen. They shall hear of thy strong hand. Amen. They shall hear of thy outstretched arm. Amen. When he come, when he shall come and pray toward this house, 43, hear thou in heaven, hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and do according to all that the stranger calleth to thee for. Why? When the outsider comes and he wanders over here to Israel and he's trying to connect with our faith and with our God, God, would you hear his prayer? Amen. Would you listen to what he's saying? Because we want all the nations in the earth to know your name. Amen. That is the essence of all we've gathered for this week. Is to say, where is he unnamed? And where can we put gospel preachers to do that? Right. Brother Josh Town is here tonight. I met Josh during his college experience. So thrilled that, that he chose worldwide and, and has served there, uh, connected to great men like Edgar Fagali, Milad Khalid, and uh, Ghassan Adad, and several of these other men, great men who are working in the Middle East, good, godly men. And I think about what he is doing. Philadelphia is not that far from here. And what has he done? He has taken, my Bible's up there, I'll just use this one. He has taken the name of Christ to say, let me walk through the Arabic speaking streets of Philadelphia and let me declare his name where he is not named and let me make this proclamation that there is no other name given among men whereby ye must be saved. This is the whole message. This is exactly for which we are gathered this week. I think... Sorry, it was that way. 
sure somebody's croaking now. We've spent six hours measuring that specifically. <laughs> I'm here to help you learn contentment. In this call of Solomon's prayer, I see clearly that Solomon wants God's people to, or God, sorry, Solomon believes the stranger should know that there is a name that will draw men to him. When I read this section of the prayer, there is a name that will hear them from heaven. Number three, there is a name that will deliver them when they call to him. But it's at verse 60 that I want you to go and see another additional point before I start my message. I wished I could tell you I was kidding there. <laughs> Verse 60. Solomon is continuing and he says that all the people of the earth may know that the Lord, Amen. that's the self-existing eternal God, Amen. the God who needs no, none other to exist before there was an is, there was God. That the, all the people of the earth may know that the Lord is God. Lord. And that there is none else. Amen. Solomon's prayer teaches me for the strangers and all the nations of the earth, wherever political boundaries have been drawn, wherever ethnicities have gathered, wherever there is a people that have need to hear his name, Solomon's prayer said this, they ought to know that there is a name that will draw them to him. They need to know that there is a name which hears them. They ought to know that there is a name which will deliver them. And they need to know that there is a name that saves and it is only one name and that is the name of Jesus Christ Praise the Lord. I look at this and I think well I think of Romans 15 would you turn there for just a second because I'm in the preachers union I get a break in 30 minutes so that's positive for you guys Romans 15. Who is writing? Paul. To whom is he writing? The church at Rome. And because of God's gift of inspiration and preservation, we have it for our benefit as well. If you've read the book of Romans in your devotional reading, you may recall the first 11 chapters have to do with the theology or the doctrine of the gospel. From chapter 12 forward to the end of the book has to do with living out your faith. It is the expression of the gospel in our lives. Chapter 15 is where we're reading, and Paul is writing to the church there. Verse 19. Well, better go to 18 for clarity I, rather than read the whole chapter, although I wished I, I, I would. Verse 18, we'll start there. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me Amen. to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed through many signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Watch those words. I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel. Not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. Amen. Paul said, my mission is to find places where Christ is not named Amen. and bring his name to them. 
But when Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, he mentioned about the significance of Christ's name. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the name that is above every name. This is the name that will save Arabic-speaking folks that have practiced Islam and other and are agnostic as you said, the, this is the name that will get the job done. This is the name that we're going to carry around. It's that name we will take to Cambodia. It is that name we bring to Haiti. It's that name we carry to Ghana. And it's through that name mankind will be saved. So when we say to you, it's missions conference time, what are we looking for? We are looking for laborers who are undeterred going to locations that are unknown where Christ is not named so we can get the job done for Christ. I think about Solomon's prayer. And I think about our modern mandate in missions today. The name that drew men to Jerusalem is the same man that he said, John 12, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. Amen. Solomon's prayer said, there's a name that hears, and all. Oh, do we not know that God hears the prayer the of his people and strangers? Hallelujah. There is only one name that delivers. There is only one name which saves. And we are in the business of people getting to hear about the name of Christ. Amen. I don't know about you. But for me, I want to be part of a church that is interested in bringing Christ's name to Amen. lost people. Matt, I don't want to throw off on you too hard here. Um, your predominant religion, not yours, sorry. The Cambodians' predominant, pre, predominant religion is Buddhism. And in Buddhism, they have to satisfy Buddha. They're looking to ascend to where Buddha is, correct? But when they hear the name of Christ, do any of them turn to him? Josh, you lived in the Middle East. You, you served there with Milad. You brought your family, probably to ra which raised a few eyebrows here and there. But you brought your family and said, we're putting a stake in the ground here. We're going to learn culture. We're going to learn language to do one thing, to come home as an American and reach Arabic speakers for Christ. Amen. When you were in the Middle East, did you ever meet any Christians? So it works. Amen. We are not dissuaded that you haven't had your one. We're not at all. Amen. We realize what you're doing. A man who comes to faith in Christ, in that culture, is abandoning far more than just simply saying, I don't believe that anymore. Amen. Perhaps it's even better that he, this one man to whom you made reference is making his transition from, from dispensing with one and reserving himself in the middle. I was going to say purgatory, but that doesn't work for us. And then considering another. But when that day comes, Josh, before the Lord, I will rejoice with you. Amen. Because wherever... Christ is not named. That's where we need to be. I've stood on Haitian soil. I've heard the drums of the doctors in the night. I've heard the, the demonic influences that exist in Haiti. I'm not even sure where you are in the, geographically in the country, but I've been in Cap Haitian and the surrounding communities there. And this is where I've heard these things. But I can tell you, I've met some of the sweetest Christians in Haiti. Why? 
because where we take the name of Christ, it works. I have no problem investing money, my own resources, to advance those who will take the name of Christ. But lest I leave this message undone, I'll say one more thing. Because it's still before my union break. <laughs> Who is taking the name of Christ to Dover? Well, you see, we hired the pastor. That's his job. Where's Mr. Wheeler? Yo, you do some stuff too. You take the burden off of him, you know. Really? Well, you know, if those heathen want to come to church, they know our address. They've seen our buses. They can get on them if they want. When they come to us, we'll reach them. You, sir, you, ma'am, you, young person, go find a place where Christ is not named. Amen. And like Paul, when he said, I fully strived to preach the gospel, what we need in this church are laborers who are undeterred, going to locations that are untold to do a labor that is unduplicated. Amen. I have confidence in these missionaries that they will go do this. I'm just wondering who's doing it here. <laughs>